Okay, welcome to the second semester. This is our first lecture on fresh water. To start off, fresh water is chemically defined as containing a concentration of less than two parts per thousand of dissolved salts, which is less than 0.2%. Fresh water can occur in many parts of the environment. Surface fresh waters occur in lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams, and subsurface fresh water occurs in pores and soil and in subterranean aquifers in deep geological formations. Freshwater also occurs in snow and glacial ice and in atmospheric vapors, clouds, and precipitation. Among the planets in the solar system, only Earth has an abundance of liquid water at the surface because of its fortuitous or orbital distance from the Sun. The planet Uranus and some of the moons of Jupiter, such as Callisto, are thought to have abundant liquid water, but this water exists below a frozen surface. So let's take a look at the world's water supply. The world has an estimated one in one third thousand million cubic kilometers of water, which is it's 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water. It's the same thing. The abundance of water on the planet Earth is readily seen on a globe by the percentage of the surface covered by oceans, which is 72 to 73 percent. This abundance of water is unique among the planets in our solar system. Because the Earth happens to orbit the Sun at just the right distance for water to exist in its liquid or life-supporting form. However, better than 97 percent of the Earth's supply of water is salt water, a form which does not exactly directly support life. Even ocean-dwelling life forms must divert a significant portion of biological energy to maintain a, um, a supply of fresh water for their own uses. As yet, there is no large-scale economical method of desalinating ocean water. Therefore, we must use the limited supply of Earth's fresh water wisely. Modern threats to this supply include groundwater pollution. Once contaminated, a groundwater aquifer is virtually impossible to clean up. The Antarctic ice cap is the largest supply of fresh water, comprising nearly 2% of the world's total fresh water and salt water. As can be seen from the table, you can see the amount of water in our atmosphere is over 10 times as large as the water in all the rivers taken together. The fresh water actually available for human use in lakes and rivers and the accessible groundwater amounts to only one-third of 1% 1 of the world's total water supply. 4,000 cubic kilometers of water are used by people each year around the world for domestic, agricultural, and other industrial purposes. This does not include non-consumptive uses such as energy generation, mining, and recreation. China, India, and the United States use the most water. As you can see from this graph that, uh, in which territory size shows the proportion of worldwide water use that occurs there. So you can see India's got a huge amount, China's got a huge amount, and the United States has a huge amount. These are also the territories where the most people live, but water use per person is about three times higher in the United States than it is in India or China. Whilst everybody needs water, people use hugely varying quantities. On average, people living in Central Africa use only 2% of the water per person um, that people in the United States do. Fresh water is part of the hydrosphere. Um, and the term hydrosphere, to remind you, describes all of the Earth's oceans, surface water, and groundwater, as well as the polar ice caps and atmospheric water combined. So let's focus on surface water. Surface water is a term usually applied to the collective fresh water on land that first falls as precipitation, which is more or less pure fresh water, and collects in rivers, streams, ponds, lakes, as well as on the surface of the land. Surface water moves down slope under the influence of gravity and creates streams, liver, rivers, lakes, and associated landforms over geologic time, and eventually reaches what is called base level, which is usually sea level, where sediments carried by the streams are usually deposited. This particular picture is a place where I grew up um, called Rock Springs in Kelly Park in Apopka, Florida. Streams are natural channels that convey water downslope by gravity. Although streams vary in size and location, all streams perform these three basic geologic processes, which are erosion, transport, and deposition of sediments. 
Streams typically originate in hilly or mountainous areas as meltwater from melting ice and snow. Beginning in small gullies, and as these gullies flow, they erode the surrounding rocks and soils into a channel. And broken bits of surrounding rocks are car carried in the stream channel as sediment. This particular picture is taken in Pennsylvania. So let's look at what happens with the streams themselves. The volume of water flowing through a stream during a unit of time is known as its discharge. In general, the greater the discharge, the greater the volume of sediment moved. Note that the discharge of a wide channel slowly flowing over a gentle slope is normally exceeded by the discharge of a narrow channel flowing quickly down a steep slope. Because water is chemically active substance, a small percentage of the minerals, such as calcite from limestone and silica from sandstone, of the bedrock over which the stream flows, is dissolved through chemical weathering through a process called dissolution. And the collective amount of dissolved minerals in the, the stream is referred to as the dissolved load. And discharge is also um, related to the amount of dissolved load that a stream can carry. When stream velocity slows down, which is usually due to a reduction in the angle of slope or the emerging of a stream with a larger body of water, such as a lake or ocean, sediments fall out of suspension and settle to the bottom in a process called deposition. The fate of all sediments is eventually to be moved from a source area to a basin, where sediments accumulated, accumulate by deposition. Sediments eroded from an, a mountain on land are carried by a stream down to its mouth at the ocean where they are deposited. However, some of these offshore sediments may be carried further down to the deep ocean floor by underwater mass movements such as landslides. In some areas of the world where tectonic plates collide, there are unusually deep troughs known as deep ocean trenches, which may reach depths of over 35,000 feet below sea level. Sediments that fall into these trenches may eventually be dragged into the Earth's interior where they may melt, and become part of a future magma. One of the features of stream uh, sediment deposition is the creation of bars, such as sandbars, and stream meanders in which the stream channel zigzags over relatively fat, flat terrain. If you visualize a cross section of a stream, you should note that the water in the center of the channel flows more quickly than the water at the side of the channel or at the bottom because they're slowed down by frictional drag. In a hilly terrain, a stream flows downhill quickly. Most of the erosion is downcutting, that is, the erosion is concentrated at the bottom of the stream bed, creating a relatively narrow, deep V-shaped channel, which is mostly straight and free from extensive meanders or floodplain. This stage of stream evolution is referred to as a geologically young stream. And this is an example below. When a stream slows down in an area where the slope is general, the water begins to erode the side banks rather than the stream bed, creating a wide U-shaped channel and a meandering stream course. Such a stream is called a geologically mature stream, creating point bars on the slower moving inner bend of the stream, while eroding cut banks on the faster flowing outer bend of the stream. So anytime the stream turns, the inside curve, the inside curve is going to be slower than the outside curve. Stream meanders may change over time and sometimes may be abandoned when a river cuts a straighter shortcut, leaving a crescent-shaped abandoned river channel known as an oxbow lake. An old age stream is marked by extensive meanders, a very wide shallow channel, an abundance of fine grained sediment due to a very low angle of slope, which is nearly level, and an extensively developed floodplain. Within the floodplain, there may be tributaries that may hold water only during flood stage. Those are called Yazoo trib tributaries. The Mississippi River near its mouth by the Gulf of Mexico is a good example of an old age stream. The picture below is uh, another good example of an old age stream. This is the St. John's River in Florida, um, and it is extremely, it's got a lot of meanders, it's got a lot of oxbows. 
Slow stream velocity causes sediment deposition to occur, combined with the shallower depth of the channel. A mature stream is more prone to flooding, in which water may flow over the river banks, carrying sediment off to the land adjacent to the stream channel. Over geologic time, the sediments carried by periodic flooding, um, which is also called overbanked discharge, on the average every 2.5 years, produces a floodplain. The, the mounds of sediment caused by flooding are called natural levees. Floodplains have historically been heavily settled by people because they are productive soils which promote agriculture. In some cases, such as the Yellow River in China, Due to progressive sediment accumulation, the stream bed may actually be higher than the surrounding floodplain, making it necessary to reinforce the natural levees to mitigate severe flooding. Floodplains are an integral part of the river where excess discharge is stored. People who inhabit floodplains should therefore not be surprised that flooding occurs periodically. This particular floodplain you're looking at is the Nile. A watershed shed is a concept that treats all surface water in terms of a single integrated unit within boundaries determined by the topography or shape of the land. The boundaries of a watershed are the highest points, usually the crests of hills, called the watershed divide, defining the perimeter of the watershed. Another name for watershed is drainage basin, and another name for basin is sink. A sink can serve as a highly simplified model of a watershed. Water that falls anywhere within a sink will move downhill to its drain. Similarly, rain or snow that falls anywhere within a watershed will move downhill to a single place that drains the whole watershed, which is usually a river. This particular um, picture was taken in Darby Canyon in Idaho. Okay, so let's take a look at the water cycle. This is an important cycle that you do need to know, so make sure that you either draw it Take notes on it from your book, whatever you need to do to make sure you've got this. Okay, so the water or hydrologic cycle is a continuous cycle of water. Sunlight provides the energy for evaporation of water vapor from the ocean. Not all the water vapor comes from the ocean, sometimes it's from other places. The water vapor is carried by wind and condensed and falls back to Earth's surface as precipitation. Some water returns to the oceans and some rivers and lakes as a result. Some gets into the ground to become groundwater. Some water is evaporated and some is transpired by plants back into the air. Transpiration or evapotranspiration, same thing, is the process by which leaves of plants give off water vapor. So the word evapotranspiration means the combination of evaporation and transpiration. When the runoff reaches the ocean, one cycle has been complete. There are other routes to take, um, but make sure that you do know how to diagram this cycle in, in a basic form. Okay, so I want you to stop and think for a minute. I want you to compare the, water, uh, the volume of water on this diagram that evaporates from the ocean in a year with the total amount of water that is in the ocean. You'll see that it's not very much. Okay. So let's look at the water budget. A budget is a statement of expected incomes and expected out outlays. In a balanced budget, both are equal. The water budget income is precipitation and the outgo is runoff and evapotranspiration. Canada's average income is 730 millimeters annually. Its outgo is 730 millimeters, which means that it's balanced. Only 52% of the water returns to the air by evapotranspiration, and the 48% that comes from the ocean is returned by runoff. So if you take a look at this picture, which portions of this cycle are available for human use?
you can see that the majority of stuff that we use for human use can take up to 10,000 years to replenish itself. Something to think about. Okay, individually, um, each region has its own water budget because regions vary very uh, drastically between region to region. There are multiple factors that determine where the water grow, goes. The first is climate. If you're in a hot, dry climate, 83% of the water budget is through evaporation. This would be like prairies in summer. In cool, moist environments, only 22% evaporates. That would be something like the cloud forest in Seattle. The second thing to consider is rainfall distribution. If you have a hot, heavy downpour, there's going to high, be a high percentage in runoff. But if you have a slow, steady rain, there's going to be a low percentage in runoff. And finally, soil and vegetation determine, are determining factors in water budgets as well. Steep, bare slopes have a high runoff. And then level, porous soils, or soils with plants, have a much lower runoff. So your outlays versus your incomes are better, or, you know, there's a better ratio to those if you have forested or planted soils that are relatively level and you also have slow steady rains rather than downpour and then stop. One of the things that we tap regularly is the water table. When it rains, water enters pores in the soil. If it continues to rain, the water moves downhill until it reaches an impermeable material, such as clay or shale. The water starts to build up and rises higher and higher as a result. The part of the ground, water, uh, ground where all the pore spaces are filled with water is called the zone of saturation. The surface of the saturation zone is the water table. The ground up above the water table is called the zone of aeration. It has three parts. Just below the surface of the, is the belt of soil water, which is water stuck to topsoil. Intermediate belt is dry except during rains, and the capillary fringe is just above the water table where water rises from the water table by capillary action, which is similar to taking a paper towel and putting it on some water. You can see the, the water spread through the paper towel. The depth of the water table depends on the rainfall season, slope of the ground, thickness of the soil, climate, and the time between rainfalls. In swamps, lakes, and rivers, the water table is exposed at the surface. In deserts, it may be hundreds of meters down. In fields and farmland, it is a few meters down, and in hilly country, the water table lies at the surface of the valleys. Groundwater is naturally filtered by the ground and is usually clear and drinkable if it hasn't been polluted by human or animal wastes or poisonous materials. The water table is the level of water in the ground. When a hole is dug into the ground beneath the water table, a well is formed. If the water table is above the surface of the ground, as on a hillside, you may have a stream. When a permeable layer dips Below the ground, between layers of impermeable rock, a sandwich is formed called an artesian layer. The top impermeable layer is called an aquaclude layer, and the permeable layer, such as sandstone or gravel, is an aquifer. Gravity usually pulls water into the permeable layer. So artesian wells are formed when wells are dug into the aquifers and the pressure may cause water to sprout, spout into the air. These wells may be a great distance from the water source and generally the farther away the deeper the well. When artesian formations are broken naturally by cracks in the cap rock, such as fissures, the springs formed are called artesian springs. In other places it's also known as an oasis. This diagram shows the development of an artesian well. When an aquifer is contained between two impermeable rock layers and part of the aquifer is exposed higher than the well, water will flow from the well due to the pressure of the water that is higher than that of the well.
At a depth of 20 meters, the temperature remains the same um, between 5 and 15 degrees Celsius throughout the year. This usually makes the water from wells cool or cold even during the summer. In the north, the water may be frozen in the permafrost and there are no wells or springs. Below 20 meters, heat from the Earth's interior raises the temperature about 1 degree Celsius for every 40 meters of depth. Water from great depths may be warm or hot. Being close to a volcano can also cause the water to be warm or hot. If hot springs emerge through sticky colored clay, it is called a paint pot or a mud volcano. Boiling hot springs that erupt because of some constriction are called geysers. Fumaroles are holes or fissures in the ground from which steam and hot gases escape which are generally located around volcano, volcanoes or calderas. Rainwater is pure due to natural distillation, and groundwater absorbs or dissolves part of what it passes through. Hard water contains dissolved minerals, usually calcium. A mineral spring contains so much dissolved minerals that it can't be used for drinking or washing purposes. It is caused by a passage through a very soluble rock, B, containing high percentage of acid forming gases, or C, being very, very hot. We have a lot of those in southeast Idaho because of the moving hot spot that went underneath us and is now located under Yellowstone. Limestone is not a porous rock. However, it is frequently split by fissures that run both horizontally and vertically. Groundwater containing carbonic acid runs through the cracks and fissures in limestone. The carbonic acid slowly dissolves the limestone and carries it away in solution. After thousands of years, fissures grow, creating underground tunnels and large circular openings called sinkholes or sinks. The tunnels are called caverns or caves. Harsh topography refers to areas characterized by sinks, sinkholes, ponds, lost lakes, and underground drainage. The minerals dissolved in groundwater are deposited in a variety of ways. Groundwater drips from, from the roof, slowly depositing lime, uh, calcite in the form of icicles hanging from the roof, which are called stalactites. To remember that, stalactites hold tight to the ceiling. On the floor below the stalactites, blunt round masses called stalagmites are formed. Stalagmites might rise from the floor as a way to remember it. When stalactites and stalagmites meet, columns or pillars are formed. These examples are called dripstones, which are calcite deposits. Dripstone can be formed when a cave is above the water table, where water can evaporate. Calcite deposits around mineral springs are called travertine. Around the openings of geysers, geyserite is deposited. It is silica dissolved from hot igneous rock. Hot groundwater often deposits minerals such as gold, quartz, silver, etc. in cracks and fissures. The most important groundwater deposit is the cement that binds sand grains and pebbles of sedimentary deposits to form sedimentary rock. This particular hot spring is known as the chrysanthemum well in Yellowstone. In some areas, the groundwater is used too much for irrigation and the water table goes down. If it can't be replaced naturally by rain, snow, or other means, water should be added by returning used water to the ground. Severe aquifer withdrawal is occurring in the United States right now, especially from the Oglala Aquifer. Freshwater runoff, water flowing in rivers or pooled in ponds or lakes on Earth's surface, is the most convenient water resource for human use. Throughout history, civilizations have developed along waterways and around lakes where humans could get water for drinking, cooking, and washing, as well as for watering their crops. 
The map right here shows the amount of fresh water available on the surface in regions around the world. Without technology, populations would be restricted to living in places where they had continual access to fresh surface water. They could only live in areas shown in the shades of medium to dark blue on this map. We know, however, that it is not the case. Humans have made permanent settlements on almost all parts of the planet. Using a variety of tools, populations have learned to survive in relatively dry areas. Humans build dams to save water that would otherwise flow downhill, dig wells to access groundwater that is built up over thousands of years, and transport water via canals from wet areas to dry ones. These technologies have enabled large numbers of people to live in areas that receive very little rain, but no one is immune to water shortages. Reservoirs can only catch water that falls upstream from them. Non-renewable supplies of groundwater become depleted, and transporting water by canal is expensive and inefficient. If rainfall totals drop below normal for an extended period of, in any area, crops, animals, and people can suffer from the shortage of water. The total amount of fresh water produced by the water cycle has remained essentially the same over thousands of years. As fresh water is always being produced by the water cycle, some people believe that we will never run out of water. However, as the volume of fresh water is being produced always remains about the same, and the number of humans on Earth continues to increase, there is a worldwide decrease per person available uh, in the availability of water. By 2025, huge populations are projected to be facing water stress or water scarcity, as you can see from this map here. Well, on that happy, shiny, fun note, that concludes this lecture on freshwater. Please uh, make it an attempt at the practice quizzes, and I will see you next week, virtually or otherwise. Thank you.